Welcome, everybody. This is the Internet Marketing Unleashed podcast. I'm your host, Scott Patton, and I'm very, very excited today because I have a very special guest. A good old friend of mine has wanted to come on and talk about uh, some really cool stuff that's going to help you in your business. And I have to say that since he was a young man, he's been fascinated by what makes people tick and why some people become rock stars in their own sphere of life and why others burn out and fade away. With his degree, degree in behavior, he successfully navigated individuals to miraculous results in their lives. Combined with his straight-talking, no-nonsense approach, seems to have the magic key to unlock the secrets of reducing fear, doubt, anxiety, pain, and creating a magical world of abundance, joy, fulfillment, and purpose. He touches lives, changes outcomes through his personal one-on-one -on -one coaching, his books, Rockstar Life membership, radio, television uh, appearances, as well as public speaking. So if you want a life that rocks, come jam with Scott Farrell and me, and he's the rock star of personal development. Welcome to the show. Scott, how are you doing? Hey, man. Thanks for having me. It's great to be around. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, One, Scott, you look good today. So do you, Scott. Thank yes, you. That's right. That's right. So uh, you came out with a book. It's called It's Not Them, It's You. So tell me a little bit about it. it it's funny. I, uh, I was sitting with some of, some of our mutual friends actually in California in L.A. And they were like, why don't you write a book about the behavior of business? Nobody does that. They write about sales. They write about uh, customer service. They don't write about the behavior. And I said, well, what would you want to hear about? She goes, what's the number one problem you hear about in business? Ownership. What with ownership? They don't take ownership in who they are, much less their own business. And so I said, okay, I, I think I could fill up about 300 pages on that. So I went around and I started interviewing senior vice presidents. I think I interviewed 400 when I was done. I said, tell me what's wrong with ownership of company. And a lot of times they told me it's the wrong owner. <laughs> I said, okay, I, I understand they've hired the right people. But what else? And then they went into most of the people that they work for, male, female, does not matter, didn't know who they were. And a lot of times, if you don't know who you are, most of the time, you're not going to progress down the life, you know, life's journey on the right direction, right path. And you're not going to get done what you needed to get done. And so many of these companies had lost trajectory or, or their focus. And the senior vice presidents were naturally uh, struggling to stay employed with these companies, and most of them were moving on. But I looked back and I said, well, if it's not them, it's you. It's kind of like when you used to break up. Hey, it's, it's not you, it, it's me. Well, it was reversed for a lot of owners because, it, no, it's all of you, it's not me. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's why I ended up writing the book. I, I, I looked back in my coaching days, and it's great. It's, I was a high school basketball coach. And you understand one thing you can stay employed as a coach. When you win, it's the kids. When you lose, it's you. And if you understand that, you can be a coach for many years. Uh, but that's, that's why right. I ended up writing the book. I wanted these, these owners to understand that if you look in the mirror first and you handle you first, your business will run that much more smoothly down the line. Yeah, I totally agree. You reminded me of when I was an assistant manager at a grocery store. And I'm sitting across from the store manager, and he is dead serious when he says, you know what, if we had 50 employees that were clones of me instead of everybody else that's out there, this store would run so smooth. And I'm biting my tongue because all I can think about is every problem I have every day that I have to solve, you caused. <laughs> you were responsible for him and him getting mad at each other, and I had to break up the fight. Right. Oh, or, yeah. You know, or you ordered 500 cases of something we sell a case a year of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it was I totally see stories that. that people told me. I, I was just dumbfounded. Some of the stories I heard. What was one of your favorite stories, Scott? Uh, it was the how people hire. And you, uh, I deal with a lot of first, second, third, fourth, fifth generation. Well, a lot of these guys are making it to the fifth generation. And they stopped hiring on skill level and hired on cup size, high heel size, leg size, leg length. And this one guy had repetitiously gone through four or five salespeople, and it was getting ready to cost him his company through a sexual harassment suit. Ouch, ouch, ouch. 
No, actually, I can't reveal any names. Or no, of course not. We, and I we don't I, want I, that. Yeah, but I, I mean, that's an important time story. You screw up. Okay, you've yeah. messed up one time. You've you've four. Are you serious? <laughs> I I always say I make lots of mistakes, but very rarely do I make the same mistake twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, come on. And that's right. You got to <laughs> learn from your mistakes. It's, it's yeah, cool. <laughs> so what? Uh, what are some of the tools people can use? I mean, this is a great point, right? I mean, you need to know who it is that you want to hire for the job, get the right person in the right position. Right. So what are some ways that people who are interviewing can hire more effectively? Well, let me, let me go back to my first premise of the book. It's not them, it's you. You got to figure out who you are first. Okay, let's figure out what your purpose, plan, direction. Let's figure out your skill set, who you are, all your insecurities, all your programming. Let's get that out of the way first. Now we get to hiring. You always want to hire the right person for the position. So many times I see today I went out to get coffee. Oh, my goodness. I think they found the most antisocial, unintelligent person they could find. Very sweet. But when I'm having to count change back for the girl who's working there, and this happens often. Uh, I'm, here, let me do it. I'll tell you what to give me back, and we'll go through this way. Now, what'd you order again? Okay, I just wanted a cup of coffee. Nothing in it. Just a cup of coffee. We've got to stop just hiring anyone and handing them a position. We've got to hire people with a specified skill set. It's funny. Look at the election this time. We've got people protesting. Now, I'm not talking about the, the paid ones, but I'm talking about people on both sides that can't handle a situation they're not equipped for. They've never been told no. They've never been told this is your skill set. Follow your skill set. So many times we've told people they've had a talent in an area and they really don't. Um, so you want to hire people. I always tell people, if somebody comes in for a job interview with me, that's for a creative. If they don't have purple hair, if they don't have piercings, if they don't have tattoos, <laughs> if they don't have something that's creative, why would I hire them? And when you sit down to, to speak with someone, let, let's say I own a grocery so, store. So you're saying you would never hire me because I have no piercings and no tattoos. Okay. No, but you're from Canada, so that makes you cool. <laughs> and you like Rush. If you come in and tell me I'm a Rush fan, you're hired. I don't care okay, what it is. There you go. <laughs> Everyone make a so note. Rush that. fan. Scott no, will hire if you. If you're a Rush fan, just hire him. Uh, uh, but Scott, what, what, you, reminded, uh, first, you reminded me of when I went to get uh, – well, I don't drink coffee, so I go into <laughs> Starbucks and I get a juice and a muffin, right? So I went in and I said to the girl behind the counter, I said, I want uh, – I want that juice, and I would like a muffin for here. And, and well, actually, it wasn't a muffin. It was something that you needed a knife and fork to eat. Okay, all right. I forget, I forget what it was. It doesn't matter. So she comes and she gives me the juice, and she starts putting whatever it is in a bag to go. And I said, and I said, could you give it to me on a plate, please? And she goes, oh, okay. I mean, she wasn't mad or anything, so she puts it on a plate. She brings me the plate. I said, how am I going to eat this? Like, could you bring me a, a you know? And so she brings me a fork, and I said, I, I need a knife too. So it was like <laughs> it was like 10 back and forth for something that should have been so yeah. easy, so simple, but she just was not, she just wasn't there. And maybe that's a problem, is finding people that get their, their, um, their, their joy of life from interacting with lots of people, right? Like if you're an introvert like me, being behind a counter like that would be deadly because that's too much interaction constantly. I need my quiet space, right? And, and yeah, and two, I, I, it's my generation, okay? I'm the tail end of the baby boom. We haven't, well, I didn't. My kid had more chores than he could possibly ever complete. But so many parents haven't taught basic life skills. And now I'm, I own a grocery store and I'm sitting in front of this kid. And you, can, you know the parent. In, in teaching, we used to say, if you met the child, you met the parent, you met the parent, you met the child. That is so true because I, ju I just look how somebody sits down in front of me. Did they speak to me? If we owned a grocery store right now, what's the number one thing you want to do to your client? Well, when somebody walks in the store, say something. <laughs> hey, how are you? How can I help you? Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Instead of giving them the stare. Yeah. Be friendly, however friendly yes. it is for you. It's not the Walking Dead grocery store where you just groan <laughs> and stare at people. Although okay. a lot of them look like that and feel like that. <laughs> yes. Speak. So when you're interviewing someone, I always look for a, a calm or, or warm disposition. I can't train you to have that. That's something you've already got when you've come to see me. So 
if I know it's it's kind of like basketball. I can't train somebody to be tall. I can't train somebody uh, that has innate God given talent. I can I can I can do the rest. So when you come to interview with me, I've got to see who you are as a person because I want a harmonious environment. I don't want strife. I don't want somebody causing trouble. So if you've already got a calm disposition, or you've got something to add with a little quirkiness, you'll fit right in. Just just great. Beautiful. I couldn't have said it better. I, uh, <laughs> I, w I ran a grocery store that had 56 employees and it's business from January, February, March to compared to June, July, August, basically tripled. Right. And what they never ever did, and it was a it was a store in a town that was basically in the middle of nowhere on the ocean. So it was like totally isolated. And they never ever hired for the summer. So the result was was all the employees worked sixty hours a week, had no time off for four and five months, and then they were miserable and blah blah blah, right? So the first right. thing I did so I went through that because I didn't know. And I got there too late to do anything about it the first year anyway. And the next year in uh, March, I hired 35 people. I actually hired 20 people. And then three weeks later, I hired another 16. So in other words, I was like from 56 people to almost 100 people. So almost doubled the staff, right? And the result was, was people got days off a lot you know there was good customer service i mean all these things that were causing anxiety and anguish and burnout weren't happening uh, but i remember when we were we were interviewed like so all of a sudden we've got like 20 people we've got 50 people in i got to find 10 or 15 right. or 20 of them right and there was a a young chinese girl and she sat there and everybody else was kind of like blah 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 you know like you know they're all young right. eight, 16 to 20 year olds you know and this cute little chinese girl who you knew was a genius said not one word and finally it's like what's your name whatever it was came out you know there was no nothing right so we hired our 20 people and of course her mom calls me oh how come you didn't hire my daughter and i said well she said nothing like she just sat there she was incredibly shy and uh and, and i need people that are a little bit more outgoing right and and she says oh she yells and screams and carries on at home i says yes that's the home environment which is different than the public environment so you need to work with your daughter so that she's more comfortable in public situations as opposed to being because we all know what our kids are like at home oh yes right and then okay. you know that's like this is that this guy is a holy terror my son is a holy terror <laughs> he goes and has a sleepover you talk to the parents <laughs> your son is so well behaved i can't believe how good he is compared to my holy terror i go yeah he's a guest he knows how to behave as a guest <laughs> yes. he doesn't know how to behave at home right yeah and, uh, and it's so funny because i guess we have these different personas that kind of pop up in different social situations right yeah and and it's got to be the skill set I, re I remember when i was still coaching high school i had a kid worst basketball player i'd ever seen oh my goodness was this guy awful but he was built like a professional wrestler i said well if he's built like this let me take him over to see the head varsity wrestling coach the kid ended up being all county and wrestling in college it was wow. the wrong sport for him right now, if I need a bodyguard, he's the first person I'm calling. If I need a power forward, not so much. Right. <laughs> well, and you know what? That's how often do do uh, let we say coaches or managers in companies not look at the power forward type and put them into the wrestling ring, and not look at the wrestling type and put them as a power forward. Like I see that all the time, where we put the wrong people in the wrong job, and then wonder why a they're unhappy and b the job doesn't get done. And then we have the audacity to get mad at them for not getting the job done. Right. I, I remember so many years ago, like yourself, I, I did the merry-go-round of employment with the grocery store. And we had a girl we had hired, and I said, she can't count. Please don't put her on the register. She's a wonderful young lady. Let her do something else. I love this kid. And then I took a week off. I came back. She was fired. I said, uh, where's so-and-so? Oh, we fired her. She was stealing from the register. No, she wasn't. She can't count. I thought I'd made that clear. Told you never to put this young lady on the restaurant. Right. <laughs> we set people up for failure. Right. Instead of going, hey, this looks like your skill set. Am I right or wrong? Well, tell you what, we've got this position over here. Why don't we put you there and let you blossom? 
I never put a kid on the floor in basketball that could not fulfill the role or position because I was setting the team up and for them for failure. Right. So how did you deal with the people who thought that they were a power forward but were a wrestler? Okay. So in other words, they wanted, because this happened to me a lot too, is like, Scott, I want to be a manager, right? And uh, and they they didn't have the capabilities of being a manager. So they have really good skills. And if they use them here and they just were satisfied, but they're not satisfied because they look over here and they think this is, oh, so much better, more prestige, more money, more whatever, right? And I'm going to be unhappy here, but I don't realize that. So how do you get them from... This is, you know, so it's one thing to say, okay, I can see your skill set. I'll put you in the right place. But sometimes people are in the right place and they want to go to the wrong place. How can, how can right. we deal with that? Um, failure is a good teacher. I, I, I had many kids go, uh, coach, I can be the point guard. I, I can play center. Okay, I'll give you a chance. We'll start in practice. Let's see what you got. A little dose of humiliation. About five minutes later, they don't want to play that position anymore. Um you give people a chance. Sometimes, you know, it, it depends on where you come from. I get a lot of kids. I meet a lot of kids who've never been told they couldn't do something. Okay. Again, I, I never watched American Idol, but I got a feeling I'd love Simon Cowell because if Simon really liked you as an artist, you had talent. And if he didn't like you, you knew you didn't have any talent. We, we haven't told kids they don't have a skill set in this position. So I've always said philosophy. I, I'll give you a chance. Now, the market's going to tell you yes or no. So if you can't, like a couple of times down on the floor with a kid who can't really play the position, the guy's stolen the ball from him twice, got rebounds on him, he don't want to play it anymore. I'm going to give you an opportunity to see what I see or don't see, and then we're going to reassess because the market will always flush out whether you have that skill set or not, whatever it is. Right, right. You Actually, you reminded me of a, an assistant manager – in, when I was managing a store who wanted to be promoted up and he didn't, he was mad because they promoted someone above him from outside the store, which was typically what the company did. And, uh, and I said to him, okay, if you want to get to the next position, then you have to write me a letter and tell me that you're willing to go anywhere. Cause I happen to know that a thousand, you know, 500 miles away is an opening that you are certainly qualified for. And so I forced him to really think about what he wanted in his life. I have this beautiful life in this small town where I've got a good position and I have no worries or and I, my kids are in school or I can uproot everybody. My wife has a job. I can uproot everybody and I can move 500 miles away into a more st uh, stressful position. My wife doesn't have a job. I don't know if my kids are going to like school. I don't know if I'm going to like this, you know, and I gave him like two weeks and actually called the manager of the other store, told him the situation, and said, yeah, like, Brian, when you're ready, oh, the guy's name was Brian, and when you're ready, uh, you can talk to, to Joe, the store manager over there, and see how you guys feel, and then, uh, and then I'll talk to the boss and see what we can do. And he came back and he said, you know, thank you very much for everything <laughs> you've done for me. I'm going to stay here. And I was like, okay. And but, but deep down, it was like, yes, you're going to be way happier here where you've lived all your life and you are happy. Like he is happy. All it was was his ego because people say, how come you didn't get promoted? Well, it's because the company policy is to promote from out of town because they want their managers to have all that varied experience, right? Oh, I understand that. Yeah. Cool. So any other things you'd like to share about the book? Uh, and, and the book is, it's not them, it's you. Correct. And I, I wanted to, we, we always talk about leadership and, and people always ask me, are leaders born or are they cultivated, so to speak? Yes, there are some people that are born leaders. There are other people that have a skill set that we can adapt to a leader, but I wouldn't want them necessarily to be the head boss. But it still goes back to the origin of who are you, where are you going, what's your purpose, what's your plan, what's your direction? Because I tell people, if you can answer two questions for other people, you're going you're gonna to win in business. Why should I and what's in it for me? Because I used to walk up from my classroom, from my players, from my clients and go, I'm going to answer two questions for you right now so you can go ahead and relax. All right. What's in it for you? I'm going li to list it. Why should you? Here's why. All right. I've just told you why you should listen and why you should do this. 
If you can do that in business, you're not going to have a shortage of supply of customers, nor will you have a shortage of supply of employees. And I always tell, I tell, I tell bosses, your competition needs employees. Don't keep everybody. I always tell people, regularly go in and fire people that aren't doing the job. I mean, if Drucker, Peter Drucker, the great guru of business, if he's right, it's 20, 60, 20. 20, you're going to overexcel. 60, you're going to do enough to get paid. And then 20, got to get fired. I still believe that. That's how it was in basketball. I got a 13-man roster. That last kid, he's just hanging on by his fingernails. But if I could get him to buy in and believe that what he was doing was worth it, even though he'd never play, I'd done something. And I never had a problem with buying because I understood there was only 13 of us when we had to get through this. But when you're running a company, let's say from five to 50 or 5,000, you got to have buy-in for the employees. And they've got to know why they're there. And they've got to understand they have value. And they've got to understand that at the end of the day, they'll get to use their skill set and have some ownership in that enterprise. And if you can do that, you're going to be successful. Boy, and that's something that almost nobody does. Mm-hmm. That's why I wrote the book. <laughs> yeah. Because how did I know that? I went and asked people. It's like being married. People go, well, how did you know your wife wanted that? I asked her. <laughs> hey, honey, where would you like to eat dinner for the next three times we go out to eat? She'll give me three things she wants to do. Why don't you ask your employees? <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow, that's earth shattering. <laughs> wow, I sound so smart. I asked somebody a question. That's right. Well, and I think that's a really good management strategy is to go around and ask questions and find out what the problems are and find out how you can solve the problems. Yeah, it, it's funny. I, I got to meet Mr. Arthur Blank, the owner of founder of one of the founders of Home Depot. And I got to go over his house one night and he gave me a tour of his home. And I, and I just asked him, what made you the most successful? And he would tell me about his interactions with his employees. He used to actually go in the store and chat with the employees. What do you think could get this better? How do you like the department? What do you need from me? Okay, how would you have felt in the grocery store if the CEO came by and said, Scott, you're doing a great job. What else do you need? I'll go ahead and supply it so you can do an optimal job for me. Be a, be a static. Okay. <laughs> you, you the way, and the way it was, was they came in the store and you were petrified because there was 14 executive levels between you and that person and they were all there and they were all picking at this and picking at that. And then there was no chance for any sort of conversation with him at all because there was 14 other guys listening. I'm exaggerating, but, you know, listening in to make sure that if you said anything wrong, they jumped in or they were ready to hammer you when he left. Yeah, I've always been over the idea that if I'm the CEO, I'm coming when nobody knows I'm coming. Yeah. I want to see my real employees and my real environment. And if it's on me as the CEO, I want to be able to correct the things I'm not doing right. And then if it's an employee issue, I handle that, but I handle that privately. But the only way to get a true evaluation is not having the 14 goon, goon squad come in at one time. It's come in. Most employees couldn't pick the CEO of a company out of a lineup at the post office. So you're, you're going to be, it's going to be in secret. You can walk in just in your everyday clothes and nobody's going to know who you are. And then if you go, by the way, I'm the CEO. Oh, sure you are, bro. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> And get an honest evaluation of what's taking place in your company because is it about your ego or is it about your clients? Which one is it? That's right. That's the key. Cool. So uh, I think we've come pretty much to the end of our time, Scott. I want to thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Scott Farrell is the author of It's Not Them, It's You, How to Truly Lead a Company. It's available on Amazon. There's a Kindle edition and I believe a paperback edition. Uh, is it is it available anywhere else? I only checked on Amazon. Uh, it'll be available on my website, uh, scottferrell.com, spelled with one T. Okay, cool. So before we go, Scott, I'd like you to leave us with one tip, like your best tip for, for businesses in terms of how they can truly lead their company or for uh, people in companies that want to become the leaders in the company in the future. Well, I'll give you two then. If it's, if it's a leader... Hire great people and get out of their way and stop standing over their shoulder. Give them a task and move. Now, if you want to get up, do something nice for somebody. Show some gratitude. First step's always gratitude. If you start with gratitude, you definitely will progress up the chain. 
Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us, Scott. Really appreciate you. I'm glad we, uh, we've reconnected. We've known each other for years. And this is the oh, first, yeah. first time we've been kind of face to face for a while, although we chat all the time, it feels like. And uh, thank you for joining us, everybody. And to take uh, Scott's uh, last tip, I really appreciate having you join us on these shows to listen. I really appreciate your feedback and your support. So thank you very much. You've been listening to Internet Marketing Unleashed, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Take care.